This is the brand new Yeti SB115. And for want of a better phrase, it's their new down country bike. Now, what is down country? They're kind of jacked up XC bikes that are a little bit more capable than a traditional XC race bike. As you might have guessed, it's got 115 millimeters of rear wheel travel, and that's paired with a 130 millimeter fork at the front. Before I get into too many more details about the Yeti SB115, I'd like to say thank you to our sponsors Freewheel for decking us out in some lovely kit to go testing in. If you'd like to find out more about this kit, head to the description and you'll find a link to Freewheel down there. Yeti are one of the true boutique American brands. They've been around for decades and have a history firmly rooted in racing. In recent years, they've released a whole raft of bikes, all based around their new Switch Infinity Link. This is basically a single pivot suspension design where the main pivot actually moves up and down through its suspension travel on a pair of Kashima coated little linkages within the frame. The idea of this is to allow Yeti to truly customize the axle path and the kinematic of the suspension to give you the best of both worlds, both great performance under pedaling, but also big hit capability too. In 2018, we saw the introduction of the SB100, which was their 100 mm cross country bike. For this, they slightly tweaked the Switch Infinity linkage, making it smaller, more compact, and flipped it by 90 degrees for a couple of reasons. First off, that smaller system was a little bit lighter, but also crucially for a cross-country bike, allowed them to fit a bottle cage within the frame, which some of the longer travel bikes aren't able to do. This smaller Switch Infinity Link has been used again in the SB115, as it is their down-country bike. So why does the SB115 exist and how did it come about? I asked Yeti this as the frames between the SB100 and the 115 look very, very similar. The reason is a lot of the guys in the Yeti offices had the 100 and they found it super capable on increasingly technical terrain. So they wanted to see how far they could push the chassis. So with a few little tweaks to the linkages, longer stroke shocks and obviously a slightly longer fork, they ended up with 115 mm of travel at the back. Now Yeti say that this isn't a slightly jacked up SB100, it is a separate bike for a kind of different category of riders. Yeti say that this is their kind of lunch ride bike. So for riders who want a fast attacking style, aggressive little trail bike that can still hit relatively technical terrain. As such, they're targeting it at riders who would compete in things like the BC bike race. So long marathon events with plenty of fairly technical single track, but long climbs and big distances. As such, this is a bike that can, in theory, handle slightly chunkier tracks, but still has that whippy, tight, solid feeling that a cross-country bike also has. So what is the point in the Switch Infinity linkage that Yeti have designed across their range? The idea is to be able to separate the pedal-induced forces, such as the anti-squat, from those of the leverage rate and the leverage curve provided by the rear suspension's kinematic and shock. This means that they can have a bike that not only pedals well, in theory, but then also has that super progressive, nicely supported suspension feel without the two interacting too much. Usually when you get a bike that pedals well, so has a high anti-squat figure around the sag point, you get that pedal kickback when you hit a bigger hit because the chain stays extended, it pulls the chain back and you get that kick through the pedals. By having that main pivot moving up and then down, what they do is keep the anti-squat relatively high around the sag point and then it drops away the further you get into the travel, meaning there's less of that pedal kickback. The leverage curve for the rear suspension is much more linear than it would have been because they can separate it from the anti-squat. Well, this means that the shock is better able to cope with a small bump, so the sensitivity is there. There's also plenty, in theory, of mid-stroke support, which is kind of what you want with a shorter travel trail bike. And there's all that ramp up needed right at the end of the stroke so that it copes with those bigger hits. So that's the theory of the Switch Infinity Link. Now the architecture of it is basically these two small stanchions on which a shuttle moves up and down holding that main pivot. Yet you say that there's a 40 hour service interval for that and you need to keep it running nice and smooth. It's got grease ports on there. It's also protected by a little bolt-on shield to stop it getting too muddy. Should be pretty easy to look after, I think. 
The other advantage of that slightly tweaked Switch Infinity architecture is that you do get the bottle cage in the frame, but also a pretty much full length seat post. So you can run like a 170 drop dropper should you wish, at least on like the mediums and larges. Yeti off their bikes in two different carbon layups, I guess. The top one is called the Turk series, and this gets a slightly higher grade carbon fiber and a slightly different layup to the C series carbon, which is slightly cheaper and allows them to bring the bikes in at a lower price. The difference in weight is roughly 200 grams. So looking a bit closer at the frame, some of the details include a PF PressFit 92 bottom bracket. You do get frame protection in there to keep the carbon nice and safe from rock strikes. 180 millimeter rotor clearances and 2.4 inch tire clearances down there. Though looking at it, it's fairly tight down there, especially if you do ride in the mud a lot. You do get ISCG 05 mounts, so if you do want to run a chain guide or a bash guide, you can do so. With a round chain ring, you can run down to a 26 tooth chain ring, so that's super low if you live somewhere like really steep. And if you want to run an oval, you can get a 28 in there. If you're looking at the bigger sizes, you can get a 34 tooth oval or a 36 tooth round if you've got real strong legs. So next up, I'm gonna tell you about the geometry of the bike and then we're gonna go through the different models that are available before giving you some ride impressions before we finish. But in true bike radar tradition, I've got some notes because I can't remember everything off the top of my head. So pull out the trusty phone. So the geometry of the SB115 is actually very similar to the SB100. So you get a 67.6 .6 degree head angle, which is, it's not slack for a trail bike, but it's not ridiculously steep. And you get a 74 degree seat angle. So not hugely steep, but again, not so much rear travel. The reach is 450.1 millimeters, which for a size large is actually fairly short these days. The chainstays feel nicely balanced, they're 436.7 millimetres. The seat tube on a large is 457 millimetres. So this is actually quite short and this is how you can get away with those longer dropper posts. If the seat tube is longer, there's less real estate to play with in terms of drop. So nice and short on the seat tube. Overall, you get a 1,180.6 millimetre wheelbase, which is not super long, but kind of middle of the road for a short travel trail bike maybe. You do get a 44 millimeter offset fork. What this means, it's a shorter offset than what you might have got previously. This gives a longer trail and means that you get a bit more stability and a bit more calmness on steeper, looser tracks. And that's generally speaking a good thing, especially on a shorter travel, a little bit steeper little trail bike. So we're shooting this video a good few days before the embargo opens. And as yet, I don't have any pricing for these bikes. However, head to bikeradar.com. You'll find the story there with all the pricing involved and we'll link to it in the video description too. I do, however, have a vague description of all the different models that are gonna be available. And there are gonna be five on sale. So there's two grades of carbon, as I mentioned. In the C series, you get the C1. This comes with Fox Performance Suspension. So that's a 34 and a DPS shock comes largely with an SLX drivetrain and Shimano Dior brakes. You get a pair of DT Swiss M1900 wheels with Maxxis tires, so it's a Minion and I think it's an aggressor across the range. And you get a largely race face alloy finishing kit along with a dropper post too. Next up is the C2. So it's kind of the same bike, but with a SRAM GX Eagle drivetrain and G2 brakes. Now with this one, you do get the opportunity to upgrade to SRAM's Access XX1 wireless drivetrains, should you wish. Then we're into the Turk series bikes, and there's three of these. So the T1, this comes with factory level suspension from Fox. So it's a 34 and a DPS. You get a Shimano XT drivetrain. You get DT Swiss's XM1700 wheel sets. You get some carbon finishing kits on there, so from the likes of Raceface and Yeti. And you also get the option to upgrade to a pair of carbon DT Swiss wheels, should you wish. That particular model is the one we've got here with the XT drivetrain. Next up is the T2. Again, it's very similar, but you get an X01 Eagle drivetrain from SRAM with SRAM's G2 RSC brakes and the option to upgrade to Access XX1 wireless shifting and those DT Swiss carbon wheels. At the top of the tree is the T3. It gets SRAM's XX1 gearing, it gets G2 Ultimate brakes from SRAM, you get factory level dropper post, 
uh, and you get fancy finishing kit. So yet more carbon, high grade finishing kit from Raceface and Yeti. And of course, there's the upgrade potential to XX1 access wireless drivetrains and those DT Swiss carbon wheels. So we've got all the details out of the way, but the most important thing really is, well, how does the bike ride? Now, I haven't been able to ride this bike for very long, so these are very initial early impressions. However, I will bring a full review to Bike Radar as soon as possible. So first off, this is based around a cross-country bike, really. So as you'd expect, it pedals uphill very well. Yeti, when they're talking about the Switch Infinity, do talk a lot about the anti-squat and the climbing capabilities of the system being detracted from the rest of the suspension. And I'd say they're actually pretty correct. In all the riding, I've left it in either open or trail mode. I've never bothered flicking it to the closed mode on that shock. Despite this, the suspension stays very stable when you're sat down and pedaling and spinning away. There's very little movement and it feels very efficient. The small bump sensitivity seems pretty good. There is quite a lot of grip from that back end. When you stand up and start really honking, yeah, you do get the suspension moving up and down, but I'm yet to find many bikes which don't really do that. On steep climbs, there is a lot of grip generated through that rear wheel, and with the suspension nice and stable, you really don't have too many excuses on those steeper pitches. Sometimes when going over a little square edge lip, then you do get a little bit of that sort of jerk as the back wheel bounces over, it's still quite an aggressive pedaling bike as opposed to something a lot more open and, and compliant. It still wants to drive forward, so it does feel reasonably stiff in that regard. This all translates great when you're on flatter, more mellow terrain. There's plenty of stability through that suspension, so when you want to put those cranks in out of a corner, the bike doesn't wallow. It doesn't sit deep into its suspension, so you get that burst of energy moving forwards. This makes it an incredibly positive bike to ride on those more mellow tracks. With that mid-stroke support, when you push it into a berm, it helps you generate the speed, and into a lip of a jump, it's actually got a lot of pop, especially considering the style of bike it is. Yeti recommend you running around 32% sag, which for a short travel bike is actually quite a lot. And that's fine because the suspension itself doesn't get that wallow. It is supported by the cranks and by the anti-squat. What it does mean is that there's plenty of sensitivity. So if you're running over matted routes, it doesn't feel too choppy. It does sort of deal with it very well. The nice thing about the Switch Infinity is that there is that ramp up. So when you go and hit the bigger stuff, you don't get the kickback and you do get the control when you land. That's not to say though that it is a bottomless travel feeling bike. You can still notice that it kind of only has 115 millimeters of travel. So if you do hit the bigger stuff, you are going to be going right towards the end of that travel. When you hit those bottom outs, it doesn't blow your feet off the pedals, but I have noticed that I have bottomed the shock out quite often. And for me, I think I'll probably run some volume spaces in it just to tune it that little bit extra. On the steepest terrain, you can notice that the shape of the bike isn't hugely progressive. 450 mil reach on a size large is pretty short, even with that shorter offset giving that extra stability. It is a short, nimble, agile bike rather than sort of like a big slugger. This does feel like an XC bike that's just been given a little bit extra va va voom, you know? I do think it would be better if it was slightly longer though, just to give you that bit more stability. That might encourage you, I guess, to go a little bit harder than perhaps you should. And I think actually before the rear end really gets out of its depth, you'll find the limits of the fork. So the Fox 34 has slightly narrower stanchions than say a Pike or a Lyric or a Fox 36. And that does mean that the fork is a little bit more prone to fluttering forward and backwards. It is lighter though, and it does suit this style of sort of slightly longer travel XC bike. What I'm saying is don't expect this bike to go and hit the biggest, chunkiest Enduro tracks and come out of it feeling great. You know, you're gonna have to work it. So what is this bike really like? It, it feels on initial impressions like a bike that really rewards a lot of rider input. You've got to work it around, you've got to muscle it around, you've got to pick good lines. But it sort of, it gives you that back. It's, it's fun to ride. Like these trails that we're riding on here today are relatively mellow, but they're fast. There's loads of corners, there's lots of berms and jumps. And it's just a little bit of a riotous bike to ride. The climbs back up pretty easy. And it's just a solid feeling bike. It's not without its problems. But I do quite like it. As I said earlier, these are very early impressions though. The weather we've been having at the moment has been glorious. I've been loving life. 
and I've been riding tracks that I really enjoy riding. So that often does help with how you sort of perceive a bike. I have really enjoyed riding it, but I think I need more time on it to give a full review, which will be on bikeradar.com very soon. I don't think it's without its faults. If it was longer, it would be more capable on those steeper tracks. But if it was more capable, you'd probably hit things a bit faster and a bit deeper, and you'd probably even start to notice the shorter travel at the back, and you would certainly start to notice that fork. But it is a bike that feels like it could have a lot of potential for the right kind of rider. As I say, down country, it, you might hate that phrase, but it does kind of quite well describe this kind of riding. And this kind of riding's hella fun, you know? So maybe they're onto something here. So this is the Yeti SB115. It's their down country bike. What do you think about down country? Is it a thing? Should it be a thing? Should it not be a thing? Let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell icon so that you get a notification every time we bring out a new video.